Welcome to the Security Weekly News Wrap-Up and Day Early, episode number 90, the last episode of the year for the week of 13 December 2020. Show summaries, the Russians, solar winds, kill switch, uh, more Russians, uh, everyone is hacked, uh, get pace 12 returns, and like I said, this is the final show of 2020. Stick around. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for Security Weekly News. Do you know where your organization's crown jewel data is, whose data it is, what it contains, and if it's flagged, tagged, and classified accurately? Defense In-Depth requires discovery in-depth. At Big ID, they help organizations uncover dark data, classify sensitive and regulated data, meet compliance requirements, and take action for data on-prem, in the cloud, and everywhere in between. Learn more about how Discovery In-Depth can change the way enterprise organizations find, classify, and protect sensitive data at securityweekly.com forward slash big ID. Increased attacks, skill gaps, talent shortages, expanding attack surfaces. Cybersecurity and IT teams face these real issues every day. CyberAfer Teams is the number one NIST aligned DoD 8140 and 8570 compliance certification and skills training platform. CyberAfer Teams makes managing teams easier, guarantees measurable training outcomes, and keeps your team's skills sharp to meet today's biggest security threats. And did you know 96% of the Fortune 500 have employees training on CyberAfer? CyberA for Teams, now you know. Visit cyberA.it forward slash solved to solve your team training challenges. All right, it's the wrap-up show wrap-up for the year. Uh, all the shows met this week, and this is, like I said, the last week of shows. Application Security Weekly number 134, John, Matt, and Mike uh, had Ev Consavoy. Uh, he's the CEO of Teleport, cool cool company name, uh, Teleport. And this set, they were talking about uh, OSS Teleport product, which, you know, that's that's uh, the, the product that Teleport makes. And this... Uh, for um, the consolidation of access controls, which I, I'm quite interested in that idea because um, that's a big problem and people really struggle with that a lot uh, out there in their companies. So the access and auditing controls across the whole enterprise, how do you manage those? Very, very interesting product to me. Uh, on Business Security Weekly number 200, Paul, Jason, and Matt had on Pedraic O'Reilly. He's the Chief Product Officer and Co-Founder of CyberSaint. Uh, the, the, that first segment was talking about how CISOs of the Global 500 are automating risk and compliance assessments. Again, pretty interesting topic to me. Uh, in particular, though, they were focused on COVID-19 and how rapid digitalization was forcing a lot of internal innovations uh, in those, uh, you know, as we've all done this and we've seen a lot of change. I think it's going to take a while beyond all the COVID-19 stuff to sort out what uh, has happened during this year. Uh, it's going to be a year that there'll be a lot of an analysis for the future about how did we do this and what happened and are we actually in compliance and so forth. In the second segment, uh, it, it was the, their, their final news segment of the year. They did a recap of the leadership and com, uh, communications lessons that they had from the whole year. So uh, that's my summary of their summary. So check that out if you if you want to get caught up on all the things they talked about uh, this year. On Security Weekly News number 89, uh, Jason Wood returned, and he was talking about how companies should stop using scare tactics on cybersecurity and about how punitive approaches maybe aren't the best thing for retaining your best people. It was, it was an interesting thing to talk about um, because I've certainly seen that. I talked about that a little bit on the show about people that tried to use these sort of punitive and or scare tactic methods uh, of management, which I'm not a fan of. It doesn't work on me, and you know, and it, you may lose some of your good people with that kind of stuff. On Security and Compliance Weekly number 5-6, Liam Downward, Jeff, Josh, and Scott had our good friend, Dmitry Zagod Zagodsky, uh, who is the Vice President of IT Security at a financial institution that shall not be named. Um, the topic was pen testing, and they wanted to define it, focus on the goals, and what it should be, uh, and what should be in the report. 
uh, and of course, this was primarily with a PCI focus uh, in this particular case. And the second segment continued the discussion uh, since the, there's no way that that bunch is going to do a single, you know, like one little block on something like that uh, with Dimitri, who, who's always great. Um, on Paul Security Weekly number 678, which will be tonight, uh, the first segment will bring back everyone's favorite game show host, uh, Roy Cohen and Shani Dodge from Vicarious. Uh, Roy is the co-founder and VP of sales, and Shani is a C++ developer there. Uh, if you don't remember these two, they've been on quite a few times lately uh, doing different things that were quite interesting, uh, including a couple of, of trivia, or they weren't trivia games, but they were a couple of competitive games that they did live on the show about risk and about uh, vulnerabilities. And I really like what they have to say. And, 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 I'm, and I'm sure that the segment tonight is also going to be quite interesting. They're talking about the need for a customized uh, identifying threat process. So, th so this is sort of a switch uh, you know, into looking at the threat surface rather than just at vulnerabilities. So again, should be quite interesting. Maybe they'll have another game. Who knows? Um, in the second segment, Harry Sverdlov, uh, the chief technologist at Zscaler, joins, uh, joins in to talk about how can we trust our enterprise software yeah, uh, I think this is, of course, obviously related to the Solar Winds debacle uh, this week. Uh, so that should also be quite interesting to uh, hear about. Uh, and of course, the news segment, uh, as always. Uh, it is the last show of 2020, so so be sure and join in tonight at uh, six o'clock Eastern Standard Time for some fun uh, for some fun with the crew. My favorite thread of the week is also going to be trust. Uh, not because trust is a threat, but because we don't seem to have it. Um, we can't trust the news. Uh, we can't trust the politicians. We can't trust our leaders. Uh, we can't trust basically anybody, right? I mean, it seems like everything this year was about, oh, yeah, no, no, this is fake. Oh, no, that's a lie. Oh, no, 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 that guy really did. Yeah, I'm not going to get into that. Um, but um, it's really hard to trust anyone now. And now most of us, I, I think we've always been a bit paranoid. I mean, that's how we got into this, uh, that's how we got into this field in the first place, but we've, you know, and, and we never really trusted anything a hundred percent, but the findings this week that a mainstream product, and I'm, I'll talk about it some more in the, in the news part, but, um, you know, a, a product that was in use at a lot of a lot of corporations and organizations contained back doors, not that were built into it when it was developed, but they were pushed out as an update. I, I think that sort of shook a lot of people up. I mean, it shook me up because I was sitting there going, wow, what does this mean? You know, my whole world is shattered. It was kind of like finding out there's no weird old man going to climb down the chimney and, and eat in your living room on the 24th of December. I mean, we can't even trust our basic software in the enterprise. So, you know, th this is this is really scary. Not that I ever did 100%, but you kind of have this basic understanding with your large-scale system that their updates and such are not going to be compromised by the GRU. It, allegedly the GRU, but here we are. Uh, so that worst case scenario I've been telling people about as long as I've been doing this, well, see, it can happen. I mean, I mean, some, sometimes people really do this. Sometimes the weird old man in the living room is just your crazy naked uncle. Sometimes it's your mom and dad getting the kiss records out. And sometimes it's Krampus. Yeah, sometimes it's Krampus. Well, this one was Krampus for sure. And oh yeah, that was that was a cheap trick reference if you didn't pick that up. So now we have to deal with the fallout of this thing. How do we trust updates? Enterprise software. I mean, without going into some kind of recursive hell of trying to validate every single time there's a patch released, which I guess we're going to have to do, and you know, and what are we going to have to reverse engineer every patch to see if it's been you know compromised and and, how, and staff up for that? This is just another example of the past coming back to nip at our nose. And yes, that's a holiday song reference. The origins of software were in house were in house engineers writing custom code for your enterprise needs. So it was just totally proprietary. Your in-house development team wrote the patches and the updates. And me, you know, that's where I started, was writing you know, patches for software that had been written by our in-house engineers. And you know, your friendly neighborhood analyst sat in, the in his web and oversaw the whole thing to ensure that it went off without a hitch. And yeah, that was a Spider-Man reference. I mean, that's the engineering. I mean, that's how you engineer solutions. Make it work and make it safe. Security obscurity will suffice. 
I mean, Doug, nobody but you and some other nerds know how this thing works, so it's fine. But roll forward 30 years, and all the other players are now in the game. The Stasi agents following you around in a Trabant uh, in ill-fitting suits are now hackers in hoodies, or even better, they're probably hackers wearing KGB medals and military uniforms. So, you know, they got a little more support than they used to. So the threat is real. The next patch that you install... Uh, is it clean or has it been corrupted somehow? I hate to tell you, but we are probably going to have to check. And, and you know, I mean, I, that's what worries me about all this, this whole thing. That, and my, my trust is shaken in, you know, in the big picture. So now that, you know, that iOS update or that Microsoft patch, you're kind of going, is this compromised? I mean, I always worried about how it would impact my system. But now I'm worried about, is it compromised? Was it compromised? You know, are we going to find out tomorrow that, you know, all those patches you've installed over the last two years were all in, uh, <laughs> happy holidays. Um, all right, then the news. Um, we're going to talk about that some more, I, I promise. Uh, special topics in the news today. If you missed the announcement before, I, I keep uh, keep bringing this one up because it is such a good opportunity. Joff Thayer is doing a course called Enterprise Attacker Emulation and C2 Implant Development for a very low price. Uh, I did put a link to register for that January class in the wiki, and he's not paying me to say that. So I'm, I'm actually endorsing it of my own free w No, I am, really. It's my own free will. No, it, it's okay. Yeah, okay. No, I am, really. Um... All right, so 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 on to the news. So back on this. So earlier this week, if you've been you know locked in a coding hell or you've been doing forensic packet analysis or something down in the you know in the lockdown center, FireEye announced they got hacked. Yep, FireEye. I mean you know so big time security company, major player, and they you know at least they came forward and they they announced it and they said okay. Well, that kind of folded nicely into this hellstorm that emerged as Solar Winds. The ubiquitous network utility uh, revealed that back in March, uh, uh, you know, a, a, as early as March of this year or so, someone believed to possibly be Cozy Bear APT pushed an uh, and, and Cozy Bear, of course, is Russian GRU uh, military pushed an update that contained a backdoor Trojan into the Solar Winds update, which subsequently meant that FireEye. The Department of the Treasury, the Department of Homeland, home, the Department of Homeland Security, yeah, yeah, that that Department of Homeland Security, you know, CISA, all the whole thing, yeah, um, the Department of Commerce, and probably a whole bunch of other people who are either not going to say we can neither confirm nor deny that, uh, you know, that, or that are going to later re reveal it once corporate legal gets finished. Going, yeah, we just can't tell them about this, Bob. I mean, it's just you know, we just can't. We can't. We we got to get a handle on it. Um, but I mean, I don't know who's going to come forward to this later. But there's a lot of customers of Solar Winds. Um, so the the Solar Winds backdoor is now FireEye named it Sunburst. So as of yesterday, Microsoft is calling it Solorigate. Which sounds like something you t you know something you take for like blood parasites, you know. Take Solorigate. Ask. Uh, <laughs> do you have blood parasites? Ask your doctor about Solorigate. Side effects may include yeah uh, that that one. Um, but uh, but Microsoft said that they have now blocked Solar Winds updates altogether in uh, Windows Defender, and so that. You know, if it's got, I mean, I mean, if it's got the malware in it, so they have a signature for the malware and so forth, then they are blocking it. FireEye, so this was the other announcement that was quite interesting. FireEye announced that they have found a kill switch for Sunburst. So apparently, this kill switch, like a lot of others, basically revolves around the 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 DNS resolution of of a domain avsvmcloud.com. And so I'm guessing that kind of like WannaCry and some of those other tools that have to reach out to the cloud to download components, if it can't get to avsvmcloud.com or whatever that, that resolves to, uh, if you manipulate that, it may cause the malware to terminate was what FireEye said. So the, they haven't really released a lot of details about that yet. But I guess stuff is forthcoming. So, I mean, this story, like, you know, this is like the biggest story of the week. I'm sure they're going to talk about it on Security Weekly tonight. They had a whole segment where they're talking about can we trust our enterprise software and so on. So I'm guessing that there's going to be a lot more discussion about this and probably a lot more writing about this in the next couple of weeks. So even though I'm not going to be here because, you know, holidays and all that, 
But uh, nevertheless, I think uh, that we'll see that. Solar Wind said that they had pushed out contaminated updates to around 18,000 users between March and June, and that updates containing the malware are still available for download until just this week. So they literally had binaries that included this malware up until this week. Additional revelations were reports that, that the SolarWinds update server, so this, this is even worse, so then I see this. The SolarWinds update server had a default password SolarWinds123 on it last year. So that was discovered by Venith Kumar, and, and, and he issued a report on that last, last year. Uh, there was another report that SolarWinds had support pages that, were, that have been taken down. Uh, that article said they took those down. Uh, but they had support pages up that advised disabling antivirus scanning for Orion folders. And Orion is the module of, of SolarWinds that was compromised. They, they tell you to take the antivirus down because the antivirus may limit SolarWinds efficacy. Now, that's not unusual. I mean, I, I have tons of products, uh, you know, antivirus products. Other products are often popping up messages saying, you know, I mean, I have like a, a thing that scans my network and it always pops up and says, oh, you should disable antivirus. I don't, but I'm like, you know, I'm sorry. No, I'm not going to let you do that. But, uh, you know, uh, they were, they were apparent. They took that down though. Uh, so anyway, this, so this article that I put up from threat post goes on and recommends that you should ensure you're not infected and intruded upon, which, you know, it's kind of like, okay. Uh, Chris Krebs, the former director of CISA had already said that if you were running solar winds, you should assume you're infected. I mean, I would, I would think so. Unfortunately, I wasn't running it, but I'm guessing the fallout from all this is going to take some time to resolve. The Russian government, of course, has denied any involvement. Okay, and it goes on. So the White House activated the Cyber Unified Coordination Group, which is called UCG, in response to the SolarWinds compromise. Uh, the UCG is an Obama-era uh, creation, and they issued a directive, I, I don't remember when it was, but it was quite a while ago, that established this group. And this group is a lot, I mean, I was, I was really glad, I remember when they established this, I was really glad to see it, because it's kind of like FEMA, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a, or a fusion center. It's a way to allow these agencies who often don't talk to each other very much to coordinate response across all those agencies. If there's serious hacking put in place. And I saw a lot of articles yesterday saying, you know, we've spent billions of dollars on cybersecurity and look what happens. So there's gonna be a lot of fallout from this directed at the government. I think, uh, I thought Chris Krebs was doing a great job. I still think that, but obviously people are going to be targeting some people. Uh, the group, uh, the UCG group has been activated several times since January 2017, uh, but this is the first time that the government openly acknowledged that this group had actually been activated. Robert O'Brien, who's the national security advisor, uh, left a trip to Europe to hurry back home and try to deal with this situation. So the NSC is definitely getting involved in this. They've been holding briefings all week on the matter. So it's obviously a pretty big deal. And then U.S. Senators Sherrod, Sherrod Brown and Ron Wyden uh, both uh, banded together to send a letter to the Secretary of the Treasury, the Treasury, the Treasury, the Treasury, asking Treasury to provide information about the breach there. And they asked if sanctions would be forthcoming if the attack can be attributed to anyone, which, you know, that remains to be seen. They also asked if Treasury had begun evaluating the overall level of economic damage that's going to result from this attack. So far, there's been very little information from the government and these agencies about the breach. I'm sure they're all coordinating it together uh, under the UCG. So, I mean, you're going to be hearing about this for a while. Uh, I think we'll probably be talking about it still in January when we come back. So we'll see what happens. Get Pace 12 is back. Uh, this worm was first seen in late October and targets Linux-based servers and IoT devices. It, it is a worm. Uh, it basically uses GitHub and Pastebin for storing its malicious code. So when you're seeing uploads and downloads going to GitHub and Pastebin, they look like you know probably normal traffic, but instead it's downloading things. Uh, Get Pace 12 has 12 different attack modules, which hence the name. And it also has a Monero miner included in it. Uh, but a new set of attacks using this malware ab apparently started on the 10th of November, which was using a different GitHub repository. Uh, and again, it was targeting Linux and IoT devices. Uh, the new attack was documented by Juniper Threat Labs. So uh, the, the article there on that, if you, if you have a lot of Linux servers and IoT devices, or you, know, you may want to read up on this thing. 
An attack which targets users of G Suite has been detected by abnormal security. The attack contains a form from the IRS called W8BEN, and uh, it and it, it's attached to a PDF as a PDF to an email. So it's a it's pretty much a basic phishing attack. Where the uh, but but I, I wanted to mention it to you because a lot of you have corporate people, and because G Suite is so ubiquitous in the industry. Uh, and they were targeted, they, they think they said they targeted like 50,000 G Suite users with this attack. They basically send you an email with an attached form. Um, basically what happens is uh, this is a regular old IRS form, one of those boring things, and the form itself is a tax exemption form, according to my, my CPA wife. Um, and it, but, but unlike the original uh, IRS form, this one has a lot of additional information and they b basically ask you for all kinds of stuff. Um, there's no payload, so it's just a PDF, but if you, uh, you know, fill it out and then put all your information on there, which included passport numbers, bank account routing numbers, and other details about you that the original IRS form does not ask for, well, you know, it would be bad, as they say. Um, the email has a spoofed source of irs.gov, but the real source is huaweimobilewifi.com. So you may want to put this up on your notification list if you use G Suite or have users that are using G Suite. U.S. CERT reported 17,447 vulnerabilities in 2020. This is the fourth straight year that the record of vulnerability reports was broken. Of these, 4,168 were high-severity vulnerabilities. Wow. The article I put up asked the question, does this mean we are pushing more unsecured code or are we getting better at finding vulnerabilities? They say probably both. I say probably both. In my opinion, bug bounties, more people focused on this type of research and just more dollars spent on it mean you're going to find a lot more. Hopefully, someday, maybe that number is going to start to go down. Sounds like I'm talking about COVID, but I'm actually talking about software vulnerabilities. And finally, this is my last show for the dread year of 2020. I started this series back in January when the world was young and naive. Uh, Paul decided to give Hack Naked News a Viking funeral last December and asked me if I would do the show going forward. And I, I, I was like, wow, uh, yeah. Um, 90 episodes. So this is episode 90. Here we are. Uh, we're sitting at the end of some sort of Mad Max meets the road meets Blood Meridian meets Cat's Cradle kind of year. And yes, those were Cormac McCarthy and Kurt Vonnegut references, among other things. Uh, all, all of those written by Philip K. Dick. Um, and yes, that was a Philip K. Dick reference, if, if you don't know. Um, <laughs> but we survived, and we will keep on surviving here at Security Weekly. I did want to thank all of you as, as we get to the end of the year for listening to the news with me this year or watching if you watch, if you watch the video. And I hope you'll keep tuning in uh, to, you know, into the color version of, of 2021. And yes, that's a Wizard of Oz reference. So happy holidays to all, you, all of you, my viewers, and, and all of our fans uh, from here at Security Weekly. And, and all the haters, too. If you hate us, that's fine. A toast to 2021, and hopefully we'll be seeing all of you in person again uh, at the cons in 2021, I hope. While I don't miss the joys of air travel, I do miss seeing all my friends around the world and having drinks in person and, and so forth. So all that, and, and happy new year, and uh, we'll say hello, goodbye, as always. And that's the news wrap-up for the week of 13 December. I'll see you next year. <laughs>